I graduated from Illinois State University in 1965, I think. And then I taught French for two years uh, in Palatine, Illinois. Uh, I'm originally from Chicago. And um, then I got married. I had a little girl in Chicago. And then my husband was transferred, uh, or transferred himself, to the University of Minnesota. He was a professor of engineering there. And um, then I had a second child. And after a while, I got a little bored and I decided to try working again. So I did what I did to get through high school and college. I worked as a secretary in a law firm. And um, I was watching what they did and I saw the paralegals and I said, I could do that. And Fortunately for me, they, a job opened in the fall as a paralegal part-time, so I could have my children take care of them and work at, as a paralegal. And I did that for about six months to a year, and as I was watching what was going on and watching the lawyers, I said to myself, once again, I could do that. So I applied for and went, started law school, Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. And then I continued at the University of Minnesota in my law studies. I have two young children, and so I didn't go to school in the day. I went to night classes, and I was there for three years because it took three more years uh, to finish all those classes at night. I loved it, I, um, and I still do. I love the law. It's so fascinating, and I was fascinated every day. I was glad to go to classes at night. At the University of Connecticut Law School is where I think I got over my shyness. I know most people don't believe this of me, but I am naturally a very shy person. And in law school, you take a course called Moot Court, where you have to write a brief about an appellate issue and then get up and argue it. And I remember vividly being so nervous as were the other people in Moot Court. And I also remember standing up starting my argument and was amazed how happy I was. It was just, I was in my element. It was wonderful. My first job out of law school was at the Office of Legislative Research and I was assigned to the Judiciary Committee at the General Assembly, which was a marvelous experience. Uh, Senator Sal DiPiano and Representative Richard Tulisano were my were the chairs of the committee and they were fascinating people. And the law was fascinating there too. And to see how it's made. But I didn't want to make a career out of just doing just research. I wanted to practice law in the courtroom. So I applied and uh, eventually was offered a job that I, I took at Howard Cohn's Sprague and Fitzgerald, which is by the way, the oldest law firm in continuing practice in the United States. <laughs> There's a firm in Philadelphia that claims to be a couple of years older, but we believe that they discontinued practice during World War II for a while. Once you are in a law firm, it's like a family. I was part of their family. But there weren't many women litigators at that time, and that's what I was. I did trial work, personal injury. In the early 80s, women were in the law. There certainly were plenty of women in law school, but they weren't in litigation. That was pretty much still a man's world. And um, you had to find out how you could best manipulate it to the advantage of your client. And I have found through many years, including up until now, that women who pattern their behavior after male lawyers, women lawyers, are doing themselves and their clients a disservice uh, because uh, although uh, a man can get away with certain things in the courtroom, certain brashness, a certain advocacy, women uh, really can't effectively do that for their client. And I'm talking now mainly in front of a jury, uh, and that's mainly what I did. I did jury trials um, because that brashness comes off as, as, as a coldness. And, 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 and women have this natural warmth, I think. I, I love men, and I love men lawyers, but um, 
you have to depend on that warmth that you have and convey that to the jury. I have, remember one case I had in New London. I was one of many defendants and there were, it was filled with lawyers the, 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 um, representing the various parties in the case. And we had done many depositions and a lot of discovery. And of course, every client uh, in the case was trying to get out of the case by offering certain months to settle the case. And um, just before we started to pick a jury, the plaintiff gave me a release and a withdrawal and said, well, we'll take, we'll take you out of the case. The jury's gonna like you too much. I don't want you in the case. And I, I thought that was quite a compliment. Yeah. At Howard Cohn, yes, I was eventually asked to be a partner in, in the firm, and of course I accepted. I was the first woman partner in the oldest law firm in the United States in continuing practice. I, I could say that in my sleep, probably. <laughs> Why I want to be a judge? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. What you have to do is submit your name and applications. And I got through the, the preliminary round. I made many trips to the governor's office at their request, got interviewed by all of the uh, governor's aides, uh, but never quite made that last step. And there was one time when I was one week away from being nominated, and I got a call from my, the person who was trying to get me uh, in at the General Assembly and said, about a week before, and he said, Connie, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to pass you by this time but you'll get in the next time. Well, that, I didn't get in the next time. 14 years later, I was finally nominated for the bench by the governor, uh, by Jody Rowe, shortly after she took office. There were six of us candidates, and I remember going down to Bridgeport to interview with her personally in her Bridgeport office. Um, and it was a very delightful conversation. And, um, but I'd had delightful conversations with many people in the, in, in the governor's office. Uh, one day my secretary, I was in the office, my secretary called into me, into the intercom and said, the governor's on the phone. And since I'd waited so long, I'd become a little hardened by phone calls like that. So I remember picking up the phone and saying, yeah, sure, the governor. And she says, no, Connie, it is Jody Rowe. And then she said, do you still want to be a judge? And I said, yes, I do. She said, well, tomorrow I will, no I will nominate you. And that's how I finally got that. In fact, one of the people who interviewed me when I had to appear before the Judiciary Committee commented that I had waited 14 years. They knew from my record. And um, he or she, I don't remember, said, well, that shows that you have some patience, so that might be a good attribute for a judge. When I first became a judge, as they do with all new judges, I was sent to the GA court. This GA means geographical area. It's where you do minor crimes. And unfortunately for the people who are accused of crimes in the GA court, most of them are not criminals. They're people who have mental illnesses or deficiencies of the mind or have addictions. And so they commit petty crimes so they can take care of those things. And most of them just need some help. And unfortunately, we no longer have the mental health institutions to help many of those people. So what the state has done is instituted programs for a lot of those people. I remember vividly one time when uh, a clerk came to me after at the luncheon recess and said, I've got to share this story with you. She said, someone just came to the counter to pay the fee that you have to pay for a program and told her, that judge just saved my life. And uh, I, I kept that with me for a long time.